Welcome back. In this week's lesson, we're going to take a look at some of the early expansions as Americans moved out west beyond the Appalachians, beyond the Mississippi River, further and further out all the way to the west coast that really gave America its shape, really gave us all of our distinctive states. Now, we talked about in a previous lesson the whole concept of manifest destiny, how manifest destiny is essentially the dominion mandate, going back to Genesis. And sometimes that's done well, and sometimes Sometimes it's not done well. Sometimes it was done for reasons of new homes. Sometimes it was done for reasons that were actually just and how the land was acquired. And sometimes it was done simply out of greed, simply out of satisfying the pleasures of the moment. However, what we see about all of these expansions, even the bad ones, is what they provided was they provided not only individual and new states, but they also provided very distinctive regions within our nation. Distinctive regions that are still distinct to this day. In fact, these distinctive regions, one of the first lessons I want you to note here, these distinctive regions gave strength to our nation because they provided such a diversity, which created what we call decentralization. It made it so that each region, with its own culture, so to speak, with its own way of doing things, yet united under things like a common faith often, or a common overall culture, was able to have such influence at the national level that it kept our federal capital, it kept our federal government from having too much power, or from having too much influence. And so the title for this lesson is called The Original United Nations, because that's really how we have to look at the states, especially prior to the war between the states. You have to understand that when we refer to the whole term nation, that was kind of a strange term to early Americans prior to, say, 1865, because nation really referred to, say, your state. In other words, uh, people thought of themselves as coming from, say, Virginia, or coming from, say, Texas, or coming from, say, Vermont. They didn't necessarily think of themselves as coming from the United States at all times or all junctures. They have still, of course, recognized that that was their federal government, but it was a collection of unique nations. And so thus, the early U.S. is really kind of an early United Nations, although it really has very little to do with today's United Nations. In fact, what it was, it was a confederation. It was based upon mutual trust. It was based upon the idea that they would mutually serve under the Constitution. And when some states, particularly of the southern states, tried to leave that same Constitution or leave that government because they felt as if their trust had been violated, a war was fought over that. So we have to understand these early ideals if we want to understand that war between the states, which is kind of the great conflict you see in our nation's history. But before we look at all that, which we'll save for later lessons, we're taking a look at why people moved out west and really what this did. So there's two ideas I want you to record by way of a principle for what came out of the early expansion of the U.S. roughly between the period of 1800 and 1860. The first I'll give you is actually from a quote. It's a quote from the book Farmer Boy, which you might be familiar with by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And in the story, she has a little interchange between Almanzo, who be would become her husband, but in this book he is a young boy, and he's speaking to his father, James Wilder. And James Wilder reminds his son about how America has become a significant nation. And here's what he says to him. He says, don't forget it was axes and plows that made this country. In other words, what you see when you look at the expansion of the U.S. is sure, you're going to have significant leaders, people who stand out, for example, men like Sam Houston. But you're also going to have kind of these unnamed people, people whose names have not largely come down uh, through the history books because they were common farmers. In other words, it was the common farmer bringing his axe and bringing his plow who cleared the land, who established farms, who established a new home specifically, going back to those old settlement colonies, those old parish settlements. That was the man or those were the people who actually made these new states 
and made civilization work in these new territories. They had an incredible vision for new homes. So we first of all see this whole idea of the family combined with faith. And in fact, we can look to another man, Alexis de Tocqueville, a French philosopher for the whole concept of faith. Listen to what he says about this expansion and particularly about the culture at this time. He says, religion must be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of America. For if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of free institutions. In other words, what he recognizes about religion, specifically about Christianity in early America, the time that he came to visit in the 1830s, was that religion was the foremost institution. In other words, the belief in a God who was beyond us, a God who had made all space and time, who was completely separate from it in the sense that he created all, but he was not created, and yet was a God who also worked in our world. He's also imminent. He's also actively involved. In fact, he sent his own son in the form of a man to save us. That whole concept, Tocqueville points out, is the foremost concept, the foremost thing on Americans' minds. And because that's there, they can live in this fallen world and actively participate in it because they also have a sense of eternity. They also have a sense of the next world. So they have a desire for both worlds because we as believers recognize that this world is going to be remade. It's not simply going to be done away with. We were meant for this kind of world as much as we were meant for heaven itself. And so that kind of belief, that kind of living in both worlds, actually facilitates, to Tocqueville says, free institutions. It creates things like a balanced government that provides incredible liberties to people, but also puts incredible checks on power because it understands that men are fallen. It also facilitates things like free speech, the whole idea that you cannot force someone to think or to feel or believe a certain way. You have to present the truth, you have to present beauty and goodness, and then you have to let the Holy Spirit do the rest of the work. It facilitates things like free uh, presses or free assembly, what we call the whole Bill of Rights or Civil Rights. It also facilitates things like a free market. The reason for all of those things is because Christianity has a solution for sin. It has a solution for how the world actually needs to work. And that's because it has Christ himself. He's the desire of all nations. And so therefore, with that as a focal point, it allows us to await the coming world and allows us to live very effective lives in this world, knowing what real holiness looks like. Like. That was always the backbone of expansion out west. And keep in mind, not all the men lived this way. Not all the people who lived out that way followed these ideals. And that's why you have incredible stories of tragedy and injustice as you look at American history. But those aren't the only tales, and that's why we don't focus on those tales. After all, it's the heroes, those who actually establish something worth pursuing, that we really want to look at. And we'll be looking at those people, and especially those movements, through the following lessons.